So my name is Rob Driscoll. I am the president of the Milwaukee Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. And before we get over to the people that all of you came to see, I just have a couple of quick programming notes to go over to start with. Um, first of all, I would like to just thank some of the people that made this event possible. Uh, starting with uh, two people from our national organization, uh, Peter Bisbee and Lisa Gazelle. Uh, Peter is here, he was the one checking everyone in at the back table. His support has been instrumental in having this event. More locally, um, the two people that have really done all the details for this event are C.J. Zafir and Libby Sobe. Uh, without them, especially Libby, uh, this event could not have happened. Uh, Libby's the one running around as answering a million questions at once. So we really appreciate her help and C.J.'s help putting this all together. The uh, second item of business is really for those of you who have never been to one of our events before. Uh, the Federalist Society uh, is a national organization of over 60,000 lawyers, students, academics, and other interested individuals. Uh, we're all dedicated to the discussion of ideas. Ideas about the Constitution, about limited government, and about individual freedom. Uh, importantly, the Federalist Society is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, we don't take any public policy stances. Uh, we do not lobby for legislation, and we do not endorse candidates. It's events like this one uh, that is the reason why we exist, and we're very pleased to have you all join us with this event today. So now let me move on to the uh, uh, introduction for our candidates and our moderator. Uh, our first uh, candidate to my immediate left is Tim Burns, who is a partner at the law firm of Perkins Coie in Madison, where he focuses on representing policyholders in insurance disputes. Tim has been on the boards of too many organizations to mention, but a couple of the more significant ones are the American Constitution Society, and is a past chair of the American Bar Association's panel, excuse me, committee on fair and impartial courts. Uh, Tim and his wife of 20 years, Pam, live in Middleton with their three children. Uh, next, we have uh, Judge Rebecca Dallet, who was elected to the Milwaukee County Circuit Court in 2008, and she still holds that position today. In her time as judge, she has presided over more than 200 jury trials in over 10,000 cases, which involve a wide range of issues, including misdemeanors, homicides, drug charges, civil disputes, as well as all kinds of other criminal matters. Prior to, prior to her time on the bench, Judge Dallet worked for 11 years as an assistant district attorney for Milwaukee County. Judge Dallet and her husband Brad reside in Whitefish Bay and have three daughters. Finally, uh, Judge Michael Skrenick of the Sauk County Circuit Court is with us today as well. He held that, he's held that position since 2015 when he was first appointed and was elected to the position in 2016. Judge Skrenick's docket includes matters ranging from probate, juvenile cases, harassment injunctions, civil disputes, and criminal matters as well. After law school, school and prior to joining the bench, Judge Strenick worked for the law firm of Michael Best and Friedrich in its Madison office. He and his wife, Karen, reside in Reedsburg and have three sons. And finally, our moderator. I'm pleased to have Professor Ryan Owens of the University of Wisconsin join us as the moderator today. Professor Owens specializes in the analysis of American courts and other legal institutions with a particular emphasis on judicial behavior. His writings have been published in numerous prestigious journals across the country, including the Georgetown Law Journal, the William & Mary Law Review, and the University of Illinois Law Review. Professor Owens earned his law degree from the University of Wisconsin, and then his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. Before returning to Wisconsin, Professor Owens was the Assistant Professor of Government at Harvard University. So as I turn it over to Professor Owens, Please join me in welcoming our panelists. All right, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, and for those watching on television, thank you for tuning in. It's going to be a very interesting and lively debate. Uh, I'm very pleased that all of our candidates are here. Uh, before we begin, though, I thought it would be useful to remind everyone that running for elected office is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's not easy. Uh, holding elected <coughs> office is also not an easy thing to do. And so 
Uh, I think it's outstanding that we have all three of the candidates here this evening. I think this speaks volumes to what we in Wisconsin uh, like to see out of our candidates, so I'm very pleased uh, about this. I also want to thank the Federalist Society for hosting the event. It's important that we do this kind of thing and that the voters see us engage in substantive debates. Also want to remind everyone that the uh, primary election is on February 20th and that the general election is on April 3rd. So the debate will follow this process. Each candidate will have two minutes to present opening remarks. After their remarks, I will begin with some prepared questions. I'll ask each of them. Each candidate will have roughly two minutes to respond to a question. Uh, I, of course, will allow a respectful, free-flowing discussion uh, when it's warranted. Uh, the candidates have agreed not to interrupt one another while they're speaking. Uh, if a candidate is specifically mentioned by name, he or she will have the opportunity to respond. At the campaign's request, I will refer to Mr. Burns uh, as Tim or Mr. Burns, uh, Judge Dalla as Judge Dalla, and Judge Skrennick as Judge Skrennick. Now please note, during the debate, uh, Libby will be walking around uh, collecting cards. At each of your tables, there are index cards and there are pens. Those are for you to write down questions you would like me to ask during the debate. Uh, if you have something written down, you would like Libby to collect them, please raise your hand high so she can see you. She will be walking around collecting them and bringing them to me uh, at the, uh, throughout the debate. Okay, Libby, where are you? There you are. There's Libby right there. All right, at roughly 6.50, I'm going to ask the candidates uh, to begin their concluding remarks. They'll each have three minutes to do so. The campaigns have, uh, and, and I have randomly determined who's going to proceed, who's going to go one, two, and three. Uh, and by that random lot, uh, first to go will be Judge Dowd, second will be Mr. Burns, and third will be Judge Scrap. So thank you for being here. I look forward to this. And uh, let's begin. All right. Thank you, Professor Owens, and thank you to the Federal Society. I appreciate this opportunity. I know that I may disagree with my fellow candidates, but I think it's important that we're all here to talk about why we're running. I am Rebecca Dallet. I am a mom. I am an experienced judge, and I'm an experienced attorney, and I'm running for Supreme Court. We're living in a time when our rights are under attack every day. Equal protection under the law, clean air and water, women are under attack. And we have a Supreme Court that is broken. Some examples of that are the special interest money that has been pouring into our state to buy justice or a justice. And in the John Doe case, when that special interest money was a party in the case sitting in front of Justice Gableman, and that party had spent $2.25 million on his campaign, he refused to recuse himself. And then the court shut down the investigation that we should all care about, about special interest money and that involvement in politics. This past spring, we had a group of my colleagues bring in front of the Supreme Court a petition to have a, a hearing to talk about having a meaningful recusal rule for judges and justices to create fairness in the system. The Supreme Court refused to hold even a hearing on the recusal rule. And then the court took those rule hearings which had been open and transparent to the public and shut those hearings down. We need to restore fairness in our courts, confidence in our courts, and trust in our leaders. I have been serving every day in our Wisconsin courtrooms for over two decades, fighting for justice. I have empowered women, I have protected the vulnerable, and I have ensured that justice was done every day in our Wisconsin courtrooms, and that is what I want to continue to do on our Wisconsin Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tim Burns. And on the Wisconsin Supreme Court, I will be an unshakable champion of liberal, democratic, and progressive values. But enough about me. I want to talk about you, like me and all Americans. 
Federalist Society members are heirs to the New Deal that created America's great middle class. You are the heirs to the struggle for civil rights that ended apartheid in this country. But instead of celebrating these achievements with the rest of us, the Federalist Society and members who support its point of view would resurrect the doctrine of survival of the richest into our law. You have provided the brain power for the reconcentration of wealth in our society that has destroyed our once thriving small towns and vibrant cities. In doing so, you have weakened our democracy to the point that we elected a perverse show dog named Trump to lead our great nation. You now help that demagogue pack our federal courts, and you sit silently by as he destroys our moral standing in the world. We are here tonight to talk about judicial philosophy. Let me give you the Fox and Friends version of mine. You talk to our parents into giving you the keys to the family's Cadillac, and you drove it into a ditch. I'm Tim Burns, and I'm the towing service. Well, first I want to thank the Federalist Society of the Milwaukee chapter and uh, Professor Owens for hosting this event. Most of all, I want to thank you, the voters, for showing an interest in an election that unfortunately all too often flies under the radar, uh, but really is crucial to the future of our great state. I am Michael Sprenock, and I am running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court because I care deeply about Wisconsin and the rule of law. I was born and raised here. I went to school here. I raised my family here, and I have dedicated my professional life to serving the people of this state. I am a judge, and I know firsthand the importance of upholding the rule of law, protecting public safety, and respecting the Constitution and the separation of powers. I have served as an attorney, and I know the dangers of a court legislating from the bench. Judges are not legislators, nor are we executives. The role of the court is to interpret and apply the law as it is written, based not on our personal beliefs or political preferences, but based on the statutes of the Constitution. Simply put, the role of the court is to be the arbiters of the law, not policy analysts or political activists. Unfortunately, as I believe you will hear tonight, my opponents do not share these views. One of them is called the notion of an impartial judiciary, a fairy tale. The other has referred to the rule of law as garbage. And both of them are actively campaigning on the political issues that they hold dear. And I find that practice deeply troubling. An independent judiciary comprised of justices that unwaveringly hold a commitment to upholding the rule of law, respecting our separation of powers, and interpreting our Constitution as it was originally intended is critical to maintaining and preserving our democracy and our republic. The citizens of the Badger State deserve the security and predictability that comes from an independent, nonpartisan Supreme Court. And if the voters will elect me to the bench this spring, that is exactly what they will get. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'd like to begin now with a question on judicial philosophy. So one of the three of you will be sitting on the state Supreme Court. And uh, I think we'd all like to know a little bit more about the approach you will take uh, if you are uh, elected to that position. So uh, Mr. Burns, we'll begin with you. Uh, so tell us what judicial approach you will take towards deciding cases. Do you believe in looking primarily at legislative intent, text of the statute, uh, the purpose of the statute, uh, pragmatism, something of that nature? Uh, what's, what's your belief on how judges should read and interpret law? 
But the, the, why do you start here? I am a big D Democrat and a small D Democrat. I believe in democracy. And I believe democracy should be given great leeway in governing themselves. My judicial philosophy actually comes straight out of the famous footnote four of the Caroline Products case. I believe that with respect to ordinary economic legislation, democracy should be given great leeway. But there are three instances where courts have to really stand up as a separate branch of government and check the power of the other two so our government, our democracy continues to function. And those instances are when things come within one of the prescriptions of our Bill of Rights, one of the first 10 amendments. We have to be very careful about legislation and government action that come within what we forbid in our first 10 amendments. Second, we have to be very careful about laws that impact the working of democracy in a way that democracy can't fix the laws. And finally, we have to be very careful about legislation relation that specifically impacts groups that historically have had little political power. Now, that's my underlying philosophy is based on democracy what, what do I believe in looking at? I believe to bring all, in bringing all of the tools that judges have traditionally brought to this task. The text is very important, and so is purpose, and so is the consequences and how the consequences line up with the purpose. And of course, our history and traditions are important for a judge to look at as well. Thank you. Judge Dell, same question? Yes, I want to quote uh, from Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, someone I greatly admire, about uh, my judicial philosophy. I'm going to quote her. Trying to define what the framers intended, I must look at that matter two ways. One is what they might have intended immediately for their day, and the other is their larger expectation that the Constitution would govern, as Cardozo said, not for the passing hour, but for the expanding future. Um, I think that that quote summarizes um, my philosophy. I do want to address this uh, statement that Judge Screenock made about the rule of law. First, I would direct him to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, who did an excellent job today of actually quoting what I said instead of what he said I said, and which gave an excellent discussion about that. Um, I absolutely believe in the rule of law. I'm the only one sitting at this table who has applied the rule of law for almost 10 years. As a judge, I do it every day. What the comment was directed at with respect to Judge Screenock is that he continues to state the rule of law, and I counted four times in the opening statement alone, as a statement, as a mantra, yet does not believe in the rule of law if it does not his, fit his political views. He worked on Act 10. He worked on gerrymandering. He believes that the John Doe case, one of the most judicially activist cases that we have in our state, was correctly decided. That is siding with your political allies, not, not following the rule of law. And when it comes to Mr. Burns, um, the rule of law is going to be subject to his political views, as he has already stated in his opening statement. I'm the only one at this table that actually knows what that's like to apply the rule of law every day, uh, regardless of political views. Uh, Judge Strunk, thank you. My judicial philosophy, I outlined it somewhat in my opening statement. Uh, and I, 
I adhere strongly to the views that Justice Scalia had on the way that we interpret statutes and the way that we interpret the Constitution. And so when the court is asked what the law says, uh, particularly if it's a statute, we begin with the text of the statute. And I, I'm so thankful for Justice Sykes when she was on our state Supreme Court, and she gave us the gift of Kalal, where she outlined uh, the proper way to interpret a statute. Uh, and I do believe that it's important that you begin with the text of the statute. We don't look first to what the legislature may have thought they wanted to do. We don't apply the legislature's unenacted intent but we apply the, the language that they chose to use when they adopted the statute. Um, when we look at constitutional questions, I agree with Justice Scalia that the, that the task of the court is to try to understand what was uh, the, the original understanding at the time, the, public, the original public understanding of the constitutional provision at issue. Now when I talk about the rule of law, it is not a mantra. I believe it is critically important that our next justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court follows the rule of law, which is that courts, when they're doing their work, begin with the, the facts and the questions of the case that they have been given, that comes to them. They do the research, and they go where the law takes them. That's what uh, Justice John Wilcox told me when I talked with him last summer, he did, when he was on the court. You do the research and you go where the law takes you. You do not decide how you want the case to come out, and then find a path to this. This is one of the areas where I do not believe it is correct to follow Stephen Covey's example and begin with the end in mind. You begin with the case as you find it. You do the research. You go where the law takes you. And I do not care what my political beliefs are. It does not matter what my preferences are. And I am telling you that I am committed to that I will set those aside. And I know that I can do it. I've done it on the bench. Now, Judge Dalla talks about my work on Act 10. Uh, those of you in the room who are attorneys know your role as an attorney is to be an advocate for your client's interests. You get a case to you, it comes to you, you do all that you can to vigorously advocate for the interests of your client. Governor Walker hired our law firm to, to assist with the Attorney General's office in defending Act 10. Our law firm looked around at the 200 plus lawyers that they had in the firm and selected three for that important task. I was one of those three. I'm proud of that work. I know Act 10 inside and out, I know the legal arguments that were uh, raised inside and out. And I know that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals said there was no constitutional impediment, no constitutional problem with Act 10. Our state Supreme Court said the same thing. That's the role of the court. When the legislature acts, and the governor acts, and the case comes to the court, the question is, did one of those political branches exceed their constitutional boundaries? And if the answer is no, the court must remain hands off. Whether I like the policy choices that they selected or not, it is not the role of the court, a judge, or an individual justice to decide that they know better what would make good policy. To me, that is what I, that's what I mean when I say the rule of law. I am committed to it. Judge Dalla thinks that my saying it is garbage and that I will only apply it until some case comes along that I don't like the result. And she's just wrong. Mr. Hertz, you have response? So um, let me respond. Uh, Judge Gallup had mentioned uh, me, the, the fact that I might impose my own political views. And Judge Sprinock uh, said something similar, uh, that I had said that the notion of an impartial judiciary was a fairy tale. Well, let me be very clear here. What I said was the notion of a nonpartisan or a non-political judiciary was a fairy tale. And that's something that probably any 10th grader or 11th grader would tell you readily. Look at the major decisions in the past century by our United States Supreme Court that have come down along political lines. Social security, unemployment compensation, the minimum wage, the maximum work pay, affordable health care, all five, four decisions along political lines, and yet we still try to convince people that the political values of judges do not matter. It is just nonsense. And also, in terms of imposing my own political values. This is 
I'm identical to the arguments we have heard for 50 or 60 years coming out of conservative politicians about judges, the legislation from the bench argument, the opposing your own political values. Well, let's be, let's be honest about this. Any time a judge expands rights in this country to protect the less fortunate or people with less political power, that argument has been made. Brown versus Board of Education, Barry Goldwater, legislating from the bench, imposing their own political values. The Warren Court's great criminal law decisions, Richard Nixon, legislating from the bench, imposing their own political powers. When a Republican judge named Harry Blackman ruled in favor of the right of privacy and a woman's reproductive choice, legislating from the bench, imposing their own political values, Ronald Reagan, in gay marriage, Lawrence versus Texas, Obridge Fell versus Hodges, imposing their own political values, legislating from the bench, George W. Bush, Donald Trump. Let me tell you something. If expanding rights is legislating from the bench, count me in. So you've all mentioned the United States Supreme Court a little bit. Uh, Judge Dallas, I'd like to start with you. Um, could you name one justice, living or dead, on the U.S. Supreme Court whom you most admire and explain why? <laughs> um, I admire Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's who I admire. Um, I also have admiration for Sandra Day O'Connor. I think that the women, uh, like Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who have had to pave the way despite great um, difficulties and challenges. If you read both of their stories, you realize the climate that they were in when they achieved uh, becoming a Supreme Court Justice and what they had to overcome in terms of harassment in the workplace, uh, harassment in, the, in law school, not even being able to find a job out of law school. Um, I think that that is something that we should all uh, admire and respect. And both of those women have really stood up for the values that I have uh, been speaking about um, and really protected those rights that we care so much about. Uh, women's rights, um, Judge, um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a long career before becoming a justice of advocating for equal protection of women under the law and did so in a way that was very um, smart and um, attacked each each case individually so that she could then achieve an outcome for women where gender equality was at a place <coughs> where it could be today. Uh, both of those women stood up for um, you know women's rights and um, fair uh, treatment under the law in general. And I think that is one of the one of the values that I look at the most is equal protection under the law. The ability to have that, uh, no matter what your gender, your race, your sexual orientation, um, and as I stated before, I, I admire the judicial philosophy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, her confirmation hearings, if anyone wants to go look at that transcript, really shows you what it means to be able to be a judge, to be able to state your values as I have done in this campaign, yet not take positions on issues uh, like Mr. Burns has done, that could force you to not be able to even hear the cases that you are fighting so hard to be able to hear on the court. She really, that balance that she struck, uh, I admire that, I aspire to that, of letting voters know who I am, what I stand for, yet being judicial and understanding that we cannot take positions on issues on legislation that's currently pending like Foxconn and having these open discussions, there's nothing fair about that. There's nothing just about that. And there's nothing progressive about that. Um, so let me respond to that. Um, about uh, Judge Dallet's attack on me for taking a position on issues. My problem with Judge Dallet's position is that it changes every other day. Look, Judge Dallin 
the first day of the campaign said that she wasn't going to talk uh, political values or values. She wouldn't point to a decision that Judge K. Bowman had decided incorrectly. On the second day, she showed up at the Democratic um, Party of Wisconsin's convention. Five years ago, in 2013, she endorsed, she supported Judge, conservative Chief Justice Pat Rogensack when she was running for her third term on the court. Now she says Justice Rogensack's court is broken. She's attacked me for talking about issues, but now she talks in many audiences about her progressive values. We need someone on this court that will stand up to Governor Walker and the Republican legislature when they act outside the law. And when you go back and forth on um, every issue in this campaign, depending on what your polling shows you or depending on whatever, it shows none of the resilience that you need to actually stand up and say no to big business, <coughs> no to the legislature, no to the governor when that is warranted. So, yes, the yes. chance of that, I want to get Judge yes, Stone please. Here for this. So, I don't think Mr. Burns has been listening to anything I've said because from the very beginning, I have been challenging the court. From the very beginning, I have been talking about the broken Supreme Court, so I'm not sure what he's listening to. Um, he has attacked my campaign the entire time and has been cherry picking and that is something that judges can't do and I guess I can't expect Mr. Burns to know that because he is not a judge. But you can't just pick the facts that you like and then not tell the rest of the story. Uh, the fact is that I also supported Shirley Abrahamson, I supported Ann Walsh Bradley and the reason that Tim Burns does not tell people about that is because then they would realize that the world is more complicated than he understands, and that there is more to the facts than just furthering his political rhetoric. The fact is that I have more than 20 years of experience in Wisconsin courtrooms, and that Mr. Burns' record cannot stand up to that. He has not been out doing the work. He has never stood up for victims. He has never made our community safer, and he doesn't ensure that justice is done every day the way I do. These are slimy political attacks. Right, the gonna... goal here is to improve the Supreme Court, to make sure it works better, and to improve the terrible partisan reputation. By your own behavior, Mr. Burns, you have shown that you cannot do that. So, let me respond. Um, to on two points. By my own behavior, from day one of this campaign, I have been candid with voters about what my political views are, and I believe the political values when you have a constitution that talks about equal protection and due process ultimately impacts how you decide cases. It has been a constant theme. But let's talk about the experience issue because I've heard this over and over again in this campaign. Look, Justice Lewis Brandeis said the greatest judge is the judge with the broadest learning and experience. And I truly believe that. But if Justice Brandeis was here today and looking at the state, I don't think he'd consider the person who spent, has spent their entire career at two courthouses the one with the broadest experience. I have litigated cases all over this country. I have supervised English lawyers in English court, Bermuda lawyers in Bermuda proceedings. I have counseled clients from Beijing to Paris. And I have taught and represented not only big business, but I have more experience representing the boards of directors and businesses than folks who have sat on this court for a long time. And that's important because this is the time we need a court to stand up to big business and special interests when they step outside the law. Thank you.
Judge Scrimmage, I want you to weigh in on this. Uh, Supreme Court Justice. Justice Scalia. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I have been so impressed with the work that Justice Scalia did on the bench. I think it's unfortunate that we lost him when we did. Um, he has, I think it is fair to say, he single-handedly is responsible uh, for turning the attention of the judicial world back to what he referred to as orthodoxy in terms of the way that courts ought to approach uh, statutes and the constitutional questions. And uh, I think the folks in this room, at least those who are uh, members of the Federalist Society are, are familiar with his work. Uh, I've listened to a lot of, a lot of his speeches uh, over the last uh, many months. And every time I hear him, I agree with him more and more. I will say this, I don't have his style. Uh, and and he, was, he was known for some of his fighting dissents. Uh, that's just not my style. I don't have a confrontational type of a style. I have a more, much more collaborative style. I, I don't anticipate uh, that I would engage in the type of dissent writing uh, that he did. But in terms of the, the scholarship that he, that he was responsible for and, um, and taking the judicial branch, uh, both at the federal level but also in many, many state courts, back to the basics of uh, statutory and constitutional interpretation, I think we all have a real a real debt. Now, um, I was fascinated to see an interview with, that uh, just Judge Sykes did with uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. And uh, the, the life that he lived that brought him uh, to law school and the bench is, is an incredible tale of poverty and, uh, and lifting himself up out of it. What was fascinating to me was he said he never wanted to be in the judiciary. That wasn't his goal. It wasn't what he aspired to. The president came calling one day and he said, okay, I guess this is my, my calling. Um, and he talked about the work that he does on the bench and it fascinated me at one point. He said, he said, you know, I find every case fascinating. He says, well, in a case that even my law clerks will think this is just a boring contract dispute or something. He said, I find, I find everyone fascinating because it's a puzzle that we're trying to, un, trying to solve as to what the law requires. And, and when he said that, it really struck a nerve with me because that's how I felt when I was at Michael Best. When I was doing the research on these complex cases that I was involved in, I thoroughly enjoyed the research. And I was fascinated by trying to figure out, what does the law say? Now I was doing that in the context of them advocating for our clients and presenting an argument that would really uh, persuade the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. I was in front of both. Uh, I was involved in uh, 13 different cases in our, court appellate, in our state appellate court system. But I love that process of trying to figure out what is, what is the answer to this puzzle? What does the law say to this complex question? And so when I heard that from Justice Thomas, I, I, that really struck a chord with me because I am confident I would find every case that, that the Supreme Court handles fascinating because each one creates its own puzzle that needs to be solved. So I'm going to stay with you on this next question. Uh, focuses on judicial elections a little bit. You've all mentioned this to a degree. Um, so you've all spoken a little bit at one time or another about judicial recusal. And I'm wondering how you've treated this issue, all of you, in your careers. So have you ever appeared before judges to whom you donated campaign money? So, uh, for the judges, have you ever sat in cases where people have contributed to your campaign? If so, how did you handle it? How have you led on this as an issue? Thank you. Uh, well, the answer to that question would be very quick and easy. I, I've never contributed to a judicial campaign except my own, uh, and uh, I, I know that I've never sat on a case uh, that involved anyone who contributed to one of my one of my campaigns. What I can say, though, is that it's important for the, for the public to understand that we have a recusal rule. Uh, we have a recusal rule has many subsections to it. Uh, nine years ago when then Chief Justice Abrahamson was up for re-election, the question of her recusal came up during her campaign because a number of attorneys had contributed to her campaign and her opponent was challenging her to publicly state that she would recuse herself from any cases that involved those attorneys. And she would not make such a commitment. And she defended our current recusal rule. Uh, current, I want to be fair here, was current without the provisions that deal with whether or not campaign contributions standing alone uh, would be a grounds for recusal. Um, and what she said was, our recusal rule requires judges and justices in every case to consider whether there's a reason that they need to recuse themselves based on all of the circumstances of the case. 
And that's what I do every day on the bench when a case comes before me. I recuse myself from a couple of cases, uh, I think two weeks ago, for, for different reasons. And the case came in, I looked at it, and in one case, I knew that this would have absolutely no bearing on what I would do. But I thought there was too much of a concern that somebody looking in from the outside would be concerned that, that I, I could not be impartial. And so I recused myself from that case. And that's what our, that's what our recusal rule requires. It compels and requires judges and justices in every single case to look at everything, the entire uh, facts and circumstances of the case, the parties that are in front of them, the issues that are in front of them, and determine whether there is a reason that they cannot remain impartial and must recuse themselves. And so it is a, it's a rule that's in place, it works, and it's required. So uh, same question to you, Judge Dowd. Have you ever presided in a case where there was a contribution or have you yourself ever contributed and how did you deal with that? All right, so I do recuse myself um, when there is any appearance that it's not going to be fair. My husband works for um, Hush Blackwell, a larger firm, and I have just made the decision to take, remove myself from any case that they handle. That is not required by our ethics rules and I talk <coughs> to our ethics People who tell me that I can try to figure out what amount that my husband may or may not benefit from the case, but I've decided that the better course of action so that it is fair to everyone involved is to just refuse myself from all those cases. So they know that when they get assigned to me, they move on. I understand what it's like to refuse yourself. The problem with the rule we have now is that it doesn't work, that not everyone will take that kind of um, initiative that's required and and make sure that our courts are fair to everyone. This is not about contributions from attorneys to our campaigns. That that is allowed by our ethics rules, and certainly if it was an extreme amount, that would be something that the, that the <coughs> judge would, would have to look at. What we're talking about with our recusal rule, that is the issue that I've been talking about, is the fact that when a party is in front of the case, and that party has spent money significant amount of money, massive amounts of money, like the $2.25 million spent on Justice Gableman's campaign, how can anyone look at that and think that that's fair? And how can anyone say that our recusal rule works? It's not fair. Even if Justice Gableman had every belief that he could be fair in that case, that does not look fair to our public. That's what we need to have a discussion about. We need a strong recusal rule so that the public understands that there are limits here, that we are not going to leave it up to justices who are not going to do the right thing and remove themselves from cases where they have a party in the case that has made a significant contribution to their campaign. And that's what we need to, to have a rule hearing about, to even talk about the issue so we can reach a resolution that makes sense for everyone. So for the same question, you, you were appeared before a judge to whom you donated? Or? I have not. And, uh, but the, I will say this is part of a much larger issue that we have to all be concerned about as citizens. Money in our political system is on the verge of ruining our democracy. And we have to find a way to stop that. And unfortunately, because of the way the U.S. Supreme Court and the Wisconsin Supreme Court have rolled in these cases, there's no quick fix by a legislature. There's no quick fix by a referendum. Courts have to fix this issue. And ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court will have to fix it. It shouldn't be that we allow massive economic interests to have a bigger voice, a more amplified voice than ordinary citizens. It shouldn't be that candidates can spend unlimited amounts of money for their campaigns. Now, I know that isn't mainstream <coughs> stuff right now, but look back at the Buckley case. Look back at Justice White's dissent, Justice Marshall's dissent. And you'll see at one time, we actually wanted democratic elections in this place. We didn't want money to have the power to destroy our political system. Take back your democracy. This isn't a left 
or the right thing. It is a citizen thing. Take back your democracy. And one final thing, I didn't get the opportunity to mention who my favorite justice was in answering this question reminded me of that because he was one of the justices I just wanted to, Justice Thurgood Marshall. Justice Marshall was my favorite justice because he lived the struggle. He knew how people less fortunate lived. He knew how people of color lived. He knew how the poor lived. And it means so much to me as a grandson of Mississippi sharecroppers, as the son of a father who was forced out of school by poverty in the fifth grade, and another forced out of school by poverty in the tenth grade, that a member of our court brought to the decision-making process something different from the normal situation where you have the children of lawyers and the grandchildren of lawyers becoming the justices on our highest court. I'd like to respond. I have two responses to two of the comments that were made directly toward me, although my name was not stated. Um, I did invest money in my campaign. I know that Mr. Burns uh, would like to cherry pick again about that issue. Um, I think it's noteworthy that five times as many of his donors are from out of state that those as of mine are, that they somehow care in our Wisconsin Supreme Court. I'm not sure why. Um, and yes, I did invest my hard-earned money in my campaign, my husband's and my hard-earned money, and that Mr. Burns got his friends that are wealthy from around the country to invest in his. Uh, he makes a big deal about these dollar contributions when he first started that campaign, talking about the dollar contributions, he neglected to mention to everyone that those were people on his campaign staff and his friends in politics who were making those donations. <coughs> Mr. Burns makes thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year from corporate clients, but then attacks me for believing in myself. And is it really a wonder that women only make up one in five, that's 20% of the Wisconsin judiciary, when we have to face attacks like this? As far as the comment of being a daughter of a lawyer, Mr. Burns knows nothing about my background, that I was raised by a mom who was a single mom, that she raised my sister and myself by herself, and it was an incredible burden, and she worked very hard. And yes, my father was a lawyer, but he wasn't always around. And Mr. Burns can describe himself as, as his family coming from poverty, and that's his right to talk about that and describe himself however he likes. And I'm not going to argue with his life story, and he shouldn't be taking issue with mine. I'm not even going to talk about his life story. But he's coming after mine. And it just shows who he is as a person. Making a comment about my father's occupation, even though my mother struggled without my father. If I, uh, I could just make a few comments about this. I mean, we've entered the silly season of politics again. This isn't a man wanting an issue. This is an issue about whether we are going to have a democracy. We cannot keep spending the kind of money that we allow candidates and rich individuals to stay on this campaign. Let the people decide. Build a wide base of voter support and let the people decide. I am so honored that I am one of five candidates in the nation that has been endorsed by the Sanders supporters, our revolution, because that is the progressive grassroots of our country. Those folks will make a difference in this election, and it should. This is our country. It's not just the country of the rich and powerful. Right, so each of you had mentioned a particular justice that you respected um, and discussed a little bit about why. I'd like to talk a little bit more, sort of push back on it. 
and get your views uh, more on philosophy, maybe on judicial behavior and the like. Uh, so Judge Scrimmage, uh, you had mentioned um, Justice Scalia as someone to whom you looked up. Uh, for all of his benefits, his values, his contributions, uh, one thing that Justice Scalia really wasn't able to do, though, was forge long-lasting coalitions of justices on the court to, to follow his, his beliefs, his ideas. He was often in dissent, uh, and a lot of people attributed that to his fiery rhetoric and his style. So many people have compared him to Felix Frankfurt, very gifted but not able to kind of forge coalitions. Uh, how does that comment, of that discussion, um, how, how does that grab you? Um, the, the response you know, about Scalia is that how you would behave, I and mean, how, how do you forge coalitions and the like? Yeah, thank you. I think that's, a, that's an important uh, question. I appreciate the question. So when I look at our, our current Supreme Court and its, and its uh, decision, I want to be careful because I think we've seen less of this uh, this term so far than we did last term. Uh, but we saw a lot of decisions that, uh, that we refer to as fractured decisions. And a lot of decisions where you have to read all of the writings and, and sort of keep a scorecard yourself to try to determine where, if at all, four of the justices agreed on a point of law. And it got, I think, really unfortunately uh, unhelpful uh, to the bench and bar in one case where we actually ended up with competing footnotes as to uh, where what the different writings meant. And when I look at the court, uh, not, not in terms of its current makeup, but the court as an institution. It's important to remember that the court is a body. And when it speaks through its decisions, I think it's important that it provide clarity to the bench and bar as to how the body is speaking, what it's saying. And I would work hard, um, and, I, and I'm not committing that, it, that I, I would never be part of a fractured uh, situation, because I, I don't know the cases that will come or the issues that might come before me. But I would encourage my colleagues to remember that the court, and I don't, and I don't mean to suggest they don't remember it or that they forget, but it's a, I think it's important that the court speak with clarity. Uh, if it chooses to take a case, that case has been coming up through the system for years. The litigants have expended an enormous amount of time and resources to get to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has accepted the petition for review. Uh, and I think they then have an obligation, if the court is able, to speak with clarity. So I would seek to build those coalitions. Uh, if I believe strongly that um, that I'm just off on my own, I would try to uh, work with my colleagues to bring others uh, to my way of thinking. Uh, I don't know that uh, that I would join uh, a majority opinion just to get a 7-0 instead of a 6-1 opinion. Uh, but, I, but I think I would be able to work with my colleagues uh, to uh, talk about the issues and come to some consensus where we could agree. Uh, and I can tell you, as I mentioned before, I, I have a collaborative leadership staff. Uh, I did a lot of work in local government. A lot of the work at, local, at the local government level is done through committees. And oftentimes you can't get anything done that unless you can build coalitions and get people uh, to agree on something. And so I've done that uh, in many areas of my life, and I'm confident that I would be able to work very well with my colleagues on the Supreme Court if I'm privileged to serve uh, for the next 10 years. Great. Uh, Judge Dale, so Sandra Day O'Connor is someone that you mentioned here tonight and in the past as well. Uh, and again, for all of her virtues, uh, she was not without, without fault and criticism. Uh, and one of the criticisms against her that was raised regularly, at least towards the end of her career, was that she liked to maintain her position in the middle of the court and not actually render legal decisions, but make very specific policy decisions, like very minimalist approach that would preserve her status in the middle down the road. And this, of course, reflects a broader debate between rules and standards and how clear you want to be with the law, how standard-driven do you want to be. Uh, what's your take on that thought? How clear should the rule be? How standard-focused or how rules-focused do you think it ought to be? Well, I don't know if I agree with the characterization. I think that What's admirable about her is that she did address the issue in front of the court. She did it in a way that was uh, sometimes uh, the way that the, mo the most limited way, and sometimes that is the way to to go forward. The courts are, are supposed to address the issues in front of them and not make broad, sweeping statements that don't apply to the case. 
Um, I also disagree with her, the statement that you maintain that she just tried to be in the middle. I think she took positions on some extremely important cases, upholding women's rights, um, reproductive rights, which was extremely important, affirmative action. Um, she was a part of the majority many times where rights, um, <coughs> individuals, equal protection of those rights was at issue. Um, so I think that that's very important. Um, you know, I think it's important when we look at the decision making uh, that takes place at the Supreme Court level, that when we're talking about our Constitution, that we're not talking about something that is stuck in 1787, um, as Justice Scalia did, frankly. Um, it, that was a time where we had no cell phones, we had no cars, we had no planes. Uh, women couldn't vote, African Americans couldn't vote, um, and we don't have any understanding or real knowledge of how things took place then in terms of what, what our framers intended. So both of the women that I, have, that I look up to really look at our Constitution as something that is evolving, that is, um, needs to be put into today's society, and that's how we get important decision making about equal protection. Uh, and protection of our rights, such as the Oberfell versus Hodges case, which um, is an important case that's most recent, and really um, expanded our right, our equal protection under the law so that same-sex couples could enjoy the same privileges that all of us enjoy in marriage and the fundamental right to that. So, uh, Mr. Burris, you said uh, Thurgood Marshall. Now, uh, again, same thing for all of his virtues. He had critics as well. Uh, and much of the criticism directed toward him was the fact that he was sort of knee-jerk in his reaction. He would defer to whatever uh, Justice Brennan uh, voted for in conference, and that he relied excessively on his law clerks. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How involved would you be on the court in terms of writing the first draft of your opinions, working with your law clerks and the like? Well, to begin with, I challenge the prince. I challenge the premise. In fact, I'm quite offended by the premise. Every time a person of color succeeds in our society, we hear the same thing, that they just don't quite measure up to the white person in the room, that they have to rely on the justice bringing of the worlds. They have to rely on those white law clerks from Harvard and Stanford. Follow me. Justice Thurgood Marshall was one of the greatest Americans of the 20th century and any century. He not only pushed this court forward with his role on the court, you read his dissent or his concurrence in Furman versus Georgia, the death penalty case. This was a man who understood people. You read his dissent in Buckley. This was a man who understood our political system. We have to be really careful here, folks. I look out on this room, and quite frankly, most of us look alike. And I will not have one of our greatest persons of colors named in in this way. So does that mean you have the same opposition to people who attack Justice Thomas for following Justice Scalia? Justice, look, Justice Thomas, I disagree with very um, much on so many issues in his twisted 19th or 18th century view of the law. But I wouldn't dream of challenging Justice Thomas in that manner. It's offensive. We have a 400-year history in this country of oppressing people of color. At some point, we have to stop. So how active would you be in your role as a justice? Would you write your own first draft of opinions? How extensive would you rely on your clerks? I did well. I was, um, and in fact, I think I was the only law well, clerk on the stage uh, uh, to a judge on one of our court of appeals um, in the United States, the United States Court of Appeals. I know in this role, there 
should be a lot of work to get done. And you want to have the help of young lawyers to get that work done. As anybody who has ever known me, has ever worked with me, I am a guy with opinions about how things should be done. And so I would have a strong call. But I just reject the notion that Justice Thomas didn't have that role. All right. Um, so moving on, Judge Dell, when is it appropriate for the state Supreme Court to cite state Supreme Courts from other states? And how binding or persuasive do you think those opinions should be? Well, when we're looking at precedent, the first place we look is our Wisconsin Supreme Court. And it's important for our Wisconsin Supreme Court to look back at the precedent uh, from all of the years before it and to make the decisions of whether that precedent is still something that upholds our Constitution in today's day and age. And that's where we start. Um, certainly, as a judge now, if there's other cases from other jurisdictions that are brought in front of me, the legal arguments might be ones that I look at. They might be ones that um, shed some light on whatever topic it is. Um, but, but they're not binding on our Supreme Court decisions from other cases are certainly not binding on our Supreme Court. Um, I have a very, um, I've been in the civil court now for almost two years, and actually my law clerk is here, who is wonderful, and we have a terrific way of um, really working on the cases and participating in it, it being a teaching and a learning opportunity for her as well um, as for me to get the help that she gives me with the research. Um, and when I look at cases, I look at uh, precedent first. I look at uh, what the, if it's a legislative uh, issue, I look at, at the legislation, obviously. As I've stated before, I absolutely believe in the rule of law. And if it's something that is ambiguous, then we go beyond that. Then we look at things like legislative intent. Then perhaps a case from outside of our jurisdiction is one that, it, that is uh, important, but really, um, we, we look first to our Wisconsin Supreme Court. That's what our justices should do uh, today. Judge Brown? I don't think it's any secret uh, or surprise that uh, our courts do, especially our Wisconsin Supreme Court, do and can uh, look at uh, the decisions of other state Supreme Courts uh, for assistance. And there are some specific issues that uh, I think we know uh, is an area where uh, the Supreme Court frequently looks. Uh, our Constitution, uh, when it was originally adopted, borrowed greatly from the New York State Constitution. And early on, our, our state Supreme Court relied heavily on uh, decisions from the New York Supreme Court, or I think it's their Superior Court, the New York's highest court, as to how uh, the New York Constitution had been interpreted. It wasn't binding, uh, but it was certainly uh, certainly helpful to the court. Uh, we have uh, situations where we have uh, model <laughs> statutes, model codes, uh, and it's very, it's not unusual at all uh, when a question comes to our, our court system that hasn't yet been answered by a Wisconsin court that we look at how other courts have uh, interpreted those same model statutes. That's not a, uncommon at all. And in, in the realm of the common law, uh, very frequently when you look at uh, questions that are somewhat touched on by a restatement, you'll see you'll see cases from other courts and you'll often see a split where, where some states go one direction and other states go another direction. I've briefed those issues before our state appeals uh, and I believe our state Supreme Court as well. Uh, and that's not improper, but it's not binding. So, but I think that there's a lot to be gleaned from those other other state courts that have wrestled with these same issues and have reached a conclusion. I think, of course, our Supreme Court should look at those when we don't have precedent from Wisconsin. I do not think it would be appropriate. I'm trying to think what the uh, scenario would be, so I won't say never. Uh, but I don't think generally it would be appropriate for our Supreme Court to rely on another state's uh, judicial decision to overturn 
Wisconsin precedent. I think that would be a dangerous activity, and, and I'm not sure what the basis for that would be. Um, we have our own body of law, and uh, we have our own constitution, we have our own set of statutes, and we have our own uh, body of case law as well, and I think it's important that we go there first, as Judge Dallin said, we begin there. But to think that uh, other state court decisions are off the table, I think, would be very narrowly focused and uh, really loses the opportunity to learn a lot from those courts that have struggled with those issues in the past. Mr. Burns, the role of the state government? There was a time in this country, in the early 1970s, I hear, in which California, New York, New Jersey, and Wisconsin had Supreme Courts that everyone looked to for guidance. California still has that Supreme Court, and that court uh, is becoming, once again, one of the great Supreme Courts. I hope that one day we have a Wisconsin Supreme Court that other courts around this country and around the world are in a dialogue with because the strength of our reasoning, the connection of our reasoning to the underlying values. Of course, I believe in the rule of law. And I believe that without precedent, there can be really no, no real equal protection, as Justice Douglas said many years ago, because the law would mean one day, thing one day to one person and something else another day to another person. But it's odd in a country where the founding fathers in the Constitutional Convention, in the writing of the Federalist Papers, in their early arguments, like Alexander's arguments in the New York courts of the late 18th century, always drew in the text of the great legal scholars of Europe. It's odd that we wanted them to get as broad a set of information to decide cases as possible. Are those decisions binding? No, but forceful reasoning always helps. Thank you. All right, next question, uh, Judge Dowd, we'll begin with you. Can you give an example of uh, a time when you had to do something <clears throat> that was unpopular and how you went about doing that? unpopular. Well, I can tell you that as a judge, it's not my job to be popular. That I have had some very tough cases as I've had my career for over 10 years in our Wisconsin courts as a judge, well, almost 10 years, I'm coming up on 10. And during that time, I've been in some very tough places. I have been in a homicide and sexual assault court for two years where all I heard were homicide and sexual assault cases. I was in a domestic violence and <coughs> child abuse court for three and a half years. And during that time, that's all I heard were cases involving domestic violence and child abuse. I presided over a gun court for a year. I presided over a drug court for part of a year, a misdemeanor court for part of a year, and now I'm in civil court for two years. The decisions I make might not always make me popular. Um, I would imagine that some of the people that have done horrendous criminal acts in our community, including sexual assault, when I have sentenced them, and it has been for a lengthy time, or for the homicide cases when, unfortunately, there have been times I have sentenced people to life in prison when I've had to look that person in the eye and know that I was taking away their liberty, which is one of the toughest things a judge ever has to do. I don't think that you would call me popular, but that is what it takes to be a judge. And I am the only one who has done that day in and day out in our busiest courts in our state and done the work on the front lines every day uh, with volumes of cases that are very high and with decisions that have to be made that are tough every day, all day, for almost a decade. Um, I think that that distinguishes me greatly from both of my opponents in this race. 
as is assumed. Judge Gallup wants us to vote for her because of her experience and her caseload. But I have to be honest, and I will be accused of cherry picking. Mm -hmm. When I look at her case law, some of it frightens me. There's a recent Milwaukee Journal Sentinel article about her decision in the Wisconsin versus Dickens case that the Court of Appeals was incensed about because it stood, her trial court decision stood for the proposition that a person and person of color standing around for five minutes in Milwaukee was subject to search. And Judge Gallup's response when she was questioned about the case was not what I expected. Look, I handle hundreds of cases, sometimes you make mistakes. And the Court of Appeals is there to correct the mistakes. The re response talked much more about this person having a weapon. Well, for every person that searched where we find a weapon, think of the number of people who were searched with their very dignity is violated by the search. So yes. That is cherry picking, and it really is out of this world. Um, how many times have I ruled against the case? Mr. Barnes, you don't know that answer, and you didn't bother to look. How many times have I been appealed and been upheld? I don't think you know that either. I've had more than 10,000 cases. I've had hundreds of jury trials. You have never been a prosecutor, Mr. Burns. You've never sat as a judge. You're not even, even in a courtroom very often. And of course, there is there are cases that are tough, tough calls, tough decisions, the kinds of cases I'm talking about that I make every single day, multiple times a day. And sometimes the appeal court disagrees. But I'll tell you, Mr. Burns, that despite your blatantly calling me a racist, and I will say that the title of the article in the Journal Sentinel is thanks to Mr. Burns' words, the response of the African American community was pretty clear to my case that was in the paper. I don't know if Mr. Burns read the statements of Senator Johnson, uh, if he saw the statements of Senator Taylor at the Women's March yesterday, or Commissioner Webb. These are leaders in our community, in our African American community, that are supporting me. In fact, the only leaders issuing press releases in the guise of these misguided attacks are those telling you to stop misrepresenting my overall record. I have been working for years to make our system more just and more fair. The hard work, not political rhetoric. I've been in community brainstorming, and not just when I've been a candidate, I've been going there for 10 years. I've been at the Community Justice Council, and I'm not sure either of these guys even know what that is. So let's be clear. In this case, there was a violent felon who had violated his parole and was carrying an illegal firearm in his pocket. It was a close call, and while I appreciate the clarification of the appeals court on what the standard is that the police should use, I'm not going to apologize for standing up for safer communities and for victims, and I think that we can do that while also trying to address racial injustice and the problems of mass incarceration. The, we could go back and forth on this all night, but for the many people of color in this community, a community that's the epicenter of mass incarceration in the country, we have to be very conscious of our 400 years of treatment of other people. And I'm not going to in any way suggest the other lives. Just try. Could you provide an example of a time when you had to do something unpopular or what it was and how you were about it? Yeah, I'm trying to think of a specific example. <clears throat> what I can say, and I think it is important, it goes back to uh, perhaps what Justice Brandeis might think about my background that I bring to the bench. Uh, I've been involved in situations where I was either uh, did something that was unpopular or was the standard bearer 
uh, for something that uh, many folks thought was unpopular. Most of my career, I, I served in local government for nearly 12 years as a city administrator and finance director. A lot of my work was done in the areas of land use planning and zoning, drafting ordinances, uh, and enforcing those ordinances and assisting the city council in doing its work. And if you think of the things that a city can do to you, including property taxation, uh, and uh, there were lots of things that the cities did that I worked for that were unpopular that I was the face of. And I would sit at my son's Little League game, and I could go down a small town. We lived up in Washburn, up in Bayfield County. I could go down the, uh, the stands, and I could, almost every family that was there, I could pick out the thing that I suspected pretty strongly they uh, were irritated with the city about. Now, that wasn't all on me, um, but I understand what it's like to, to be an unpopular figure for those reasons. As an attorney, uh, I represented a number of clients that had opponents. And I, I've, been in, uh, I've been in local public hearings representing my clients where we literally had gymnasiums full of people uh, that were not very uh, thrilled with the plans uh, of, my, uh, of my clients. Um, as a judge, Judge Dallas, right, you, you rule in a case, um, you often have people who leave uh, the courtroom unhappy. But what I said in my investiture is what I try to do every day. And that is to make sure that every individual that comes through my court leaves believing that they got a fair shake, believing that they were, they were on a fair playing field with their opponent, whatever, whoever that might be, whether we have a pro se individual uh, with uh, an opponent that has an attorney or not, uh, whether they're both represented, whether they're both pro se. It's, it's important to me that people that come through my courtroom believe that justice was done, that's done by following the law. I had one guy finger wagging at me uh, because he just kept saying, do justice, do justice, do justice. And that was all he had because the law wasn't on his side. And he lost and he left unhappy. Um, but it's not my job to make people happy. It's my job to apply the law and to do so faithfully. And I understand that on the Supreme Court, cases get there very often uh, that um, have statewide impact and that have charged feelings on both sides, and the decision of the court is going to be unpopular, whatever it is. And uh, I'm, I'm prepared to, to be in that role. I've done it my entire career. I know what that feels like, and I know what it feels like to just do the right thing, uh, even though it may be unpopular. Sure. Uh, so, uh, you mean other than killing Santa Claus in this campaign? So, Look, I am the first candidate on the left in the state for this position who has said that enough is enough with this nonsense that judges don't think political issues, political decisions. Do voters agree with me? Yes. Does it make me a popular guy with lawyers and judges? They're my hardest audience. But the truth remains that our decisions in these cases, the Wisconsin Supreme Court takes 50 to 60 cases a year. Only a third of them are criminal procedure cases. In the reps, in those 40 or so cases, they shape our economy and our political system. And as voters, as citizens, we have to demand that we know their values. We know what we're voting for. And that's a tough message to sell in this crowd and in crowds of judges. But I will tell you this, it's not a tough message to sell in Baraboo, it's not a tough message to sell. In Viroqua, it's not a tough message to sell. In Prairie du Chien, because people, voters, know something is wrong with our system right now. It's on a knife's edge, and someone has to step up and speak the truth. All right. Well, I think it's time now, actually, for us to turn to closing remarks. 
So the order of the remarks will go the same as the introduction, Judge Gallup. Thank you. This is a critical time in our nation's history. Our institutions, those that have held up our great democracy for more than 200 years, are under tremendous assault. Special interests, which many of the founding fathers warned us against, have huge power. Our community's norms are being violated, and the people's trust in government and the system is at an all-time low. There are very few people who think government by tweet is good or acceptable. Maybe there are some of you in this room, but I'll tell you, I think it's terrible. I have strong Wisconsin values. I believe in clean air and water. I believe in our public education system. And I believe in working people. I think we need to ensure we increase participation in our voting system, not decrease it. I think we need to address racial and gender inequality head on, not sweep the vestiges of a racist and patriarchal system under the rug. That's who I am, and you deserve to know who I am. But I also don't think we need to further politicize the judiciary. What we've heard today is one political figure spouting the same tired talking points to appeal to the far right wing, and one designed to appeal to the far left. One calls me too liberal, and one calls me too conservative. It looks like I'm the only judge in this room. Both would further politicize the judiciary. Both are in this campaign for the wrong reasons. I'm here because I believe in an independent judiciary, not to achieve a political goal. I'm here because I think that my experience, which is very different than both of these other candidates, readies me to serve as our next Supreme Court Justice. I have served the public for more than 20 years. I have helped victims, I have prosecuted criminals, and now for a decade, I have upheld the law. I haven't gotten it right in every single one of my 10,000 cases I've overseen. But there was a reason that I was elected and re-elected, and that I'm rated very highly as a judge. That I've been asked to train other judges as an associate dean of our state's judicial college. That I'm upheld by appeals courts the vast majority of the time. It's because I know what I'm doing. I want the votes of the people of Wisconsin because we need to return common sense to the bench. No more politics just making Wisconsin stronger. And I appreciate all of your vote. Thank you. I started this evening by saying that on um, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, I would be an unshakable champion of liberal, democratic, and progressive values. Let me back up a bit and make sure I tell you why. I am the grandson of Mississippi sharecroppers whose parents were forced out of school at early ages by poverty. But I grew up after this nation had built the strongest middle class in the history of the planet. That middle class democracy gave me the opportunity to work hard and become one of the top lawyers, not just in the state, but in the day nation. And doing what I love doing best, which some people might find not so good, but I love suing insurance companies. Now, I've had the great privilege to represent clients in 36 different states and 10 foreign countries. And I've been a partner in three of the largest and most prestigious law firms in this country. But I did not learn my values in those fancy law firms. I want to learn my values. Actually, picking charity for eight cents a pound, but working alongside the families of migrant farm workers. I may have only made $10 a day in those cherry orchards, but that experience taught me the most valuable lesson of my life, and that's this. Everybody wants and deserves opportunity 
for themselves and their children. And ultimately, that's why I'm running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Because in the span of my adulthood, equal opportunity for the children and people who struggle has disappeared. I'm Tim Burns. I would appreciate your support in my election for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Thank you for your courtesy tonight. That's great. Thank you. Once again, I do want to thank the Federalist Society and uh, Professor Owens for hosting this event. Thank you all for your attention tonight. I uh, appreciate you being here. I want to remind everybody uh, where we've been as a state. I want to take us back to the mid-2000s after uh, Justice Sykes had gone to the federal bench. We saw in rapid fire succession a number of cases uh, decided by the majority of the Supreme Court at that time that truly were activists. They were results-oriented decisions. And we saw it in case after case after case. And it was that time that, where voters in the state woke up and understood the danger that's inherent in having a Supreme Court that decides it's empowered to do whatever it wants in the cases that come before it. It's what drove Justice Gableman to run uh, 10 years ago in order to get the court back on track and to be one that follows the law. I want to give you another story from that same time frame. It's during that time, during the mid-2000s, I was able to watch, uh, to go to a, a seminar where uh, one of the constitutional court judges uh, from one of the, the European countries came and spoke. And Chief Justice Abrahamson uh, came and introduced him, and it was clear that she was, uh, in fact, she said, she was really impressed with the work that that court was doing, and, uh, and introduced him, and he talked a lot about the work that they were doing on their constitutional court. He said, we have two courts. We have the constitutional court, and we have, I think it was the court of law. And he was very proud. He said, you know what? Early on, the constitutional court was sort of a nothing court. And then we discovered that we could find a constitutional issue in nearly every case. And he said, every important case that comes through our court system now comes through the constitutional court. And we've rendered the court of law as a, nearly a, a mere melody. And I walked out of that room and I, and I ran into uh, a law professor. He said, hey, were you able to, to see the speech? And I said, yeah. He said, what did you think? And I blurted out, I'm glad I don't live in that country. Because I don't believe that's the role of the court, to decide that they can decide every case however they want because they can find a constitutional question. Or as Justice Scalia said, if you can find ambiguity, ambiguity in every statute, the world's your oyster. I don't want to see our Wisconsin Supreme Court go back to that time where we have a majority of justices who feel empowered to do the right thing in every case. It's not a court of good ideas. It's a court of law. Good ideas are implemented in the other branches in our capital, through the legislature and the governor's office and the executive branch. That's where policy is set. When cases come before the court, it should not be a policy question. That is not a partisan question. I have met with people all across the state. I met with a legislator, uh, I think two weeks ago, I had just met him, I'd never met him before, and I explained to him my judicial philosophy. And I said, what I just told you, I believe to my core, and it doesn't matter what party is in control. And he looked at me, and he said, if we make a mistake, you should tell us. That's what legislators want. They don't want a rubber stamp. I will not be a rubber stamp. <laughs> But I will not stand in the way, no matter what party is in control, if the legislature acts lawfully. I will not stand in their way because I think it's a bad idea. I think that's the only appropriate role for our Supreme Court. I believe it strongly and firmly. It's not a partisan question. I thank you all for being here tonight, and I would urge you to vote on February 20th, and I would be honored if you would vote for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank our candidates for appearing. Uh, this was a great, lively discussion. I want to thank you all for being here and the Federal Society for hosting this. Uh, please remember February 20th is the day to vote. Take care and have a good night.